Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 167, Game of Palooza, Sean Con, Vacation Gaming, and more. I am Sean of Sean Con, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record right here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And it would be awesome if you would join us in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. So tonight we've got a super game filled episode as we spend most of the show talking about the games we played since the last time we were here. Since that time, we've started the Coded Chronicles Goonies game with the family. Dan and I played a bunch of two player games while on our far too short vacation. Tron was in town and we played a bunch of games as part of the first, hopefully first, Tron Con of 2022 and more. Now, along with this, we will be reviewing one of the games we'll be talking about, a prototype copy of the Glory expansion for Draconis Invasion, a game that made our best new to us games of 2021 list. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a quick comment on our topic of digital map making tools for RPGs. Mike Grant writes, helpful show. Thanks, Mike. Uh, this one was fun to research, and it's something I've actually been thinking. I wonder if it's changed since the last time we looked at it. Now, it's, I think that was soon enough. We probably don't want to look at it again right away. But I am tempted to get back to that one, say, maybe once a quarter or every six months, just to see if there's something new out there. Well, next, another quick one from Jay Feast about our topic of narrative adventure games great for younger kids. They write, Stuffed Fables has such a cute theme. Great episode. Thanks, Jay. And I got to say, Stuffed Fables has one of the best themes in board gaming of all time, and I don't know if it's ever going to be beat. Well, next, we move on to our Doodle Dungeon review that got these comments. Ross Kingston writes, Got it yesterday, opened it, Looked at the contents. That's all so far. The girlfriend is interested in playing pretty darn nice for like 25 bucks. Nice. And Ring It On Card Game writes, looks fun. Well, thanks, Ring It On and Ross. Always great to hear that our reviews have led people to pick up games. That's always appreciated. And I'm sure the publishers appreciate it as well. Well, Dr. Spock7 asks, what do you do with them once complete? Shadow box? Frame? or take apart to enjoy again, as in regards to our Majestic Wolf puzzle review. Well, Doc, we took it apart, and we passed it on to another couple who really enjoy building Jizzetop puzzles with their extended family. And I guess we did the same thing with Quezzle as well. Now, if we hadn't done that, I would have been really tempted to somehow glue it all together, except leave those specialty pieces, right? The uniquely shaped pieces available to be pulled out somehow, and then put it up on a wall in our game room. Now, the big problem with that being we don't really have wall space left in our game room. So that's one of the main reasons we didn't even consider that. But had I had the space, we might have considered it. Plus, if we I don't even know, are we getting these games back eventually or if there were gifts or if there were Lent? I don't even know, actually, at this point. I'm hoping if they, uh, the people we gave it to, don't do something like that, that they pass it on to someone who also enjoys jigsaw puzzles. All right, well, next up. Sharing pics of the classic 1980s ElfQuest game got us quite a few comments, mm -hmm. including M. I. Science Guy, who wrote, Not sure if that playmat makes me sad or angry in regards to the paper board. Foul Play Games wrote, Love the colors on these illustrations. And John McDonald 79 wrote, My Blue Box Edition 1986 had no such trappings in regards to the box insert pics we shared on Instagram. Well, thanks all of you for the comments. Uh, along with these were a lot of people pointing out they had no idea this game existed and a whole bunch of where do I get it and I want it comments. Now, in regards to the comments we did highlight tonight, uh, for the playmat, it works. All it really is is a tool to make sure your tiles are laid out properly. You could have easily just measured it or, or you know, laid out tiles and removed some to make sure everything's in the right place, kind of like the old Twilight Imperium. It, it You could even play without it. Personally, it didn't bother me. Like, I got to admit, when I opened the box, I was like, wow, there's a paper board. But it doesn't really affect gameplay at all. Now, as for the box sensor, I didn't realize that was added to the second edition. Now, what I do know is that artwork, 
um, which Foul Play Games called out, is new in that version. The artwork and the color was totally redone for the second edition and greatly improved art and colors off the original. So if you are looking to find a copy of this game, note you're not going to find it new, but it is available on the secondary market. I strongly recommend looking for the second edition of ElfQuest, the board game from Mayfair Games. Now, due to taking a week off, we've got a lot more comments, but I think we'll save some for next week. But let's finish off with a number of comments we got on our Chronicles of Avell content. Now, Ross Kingston writes, Got my copy yesterday, in part due to your review. Awesome, Ross. Now, Sean Die Rolling writes, Nope, sorry, Die Rolling writes, I have <laughs> the boots and companions for this now. Looking forward to seeing what that does for my little adventurers. Yeah, as noted in the review, we strongly recommend picking up the expansion. And if you can, get it in a bundle with the base game. You're, you're going to want it eventually. All right, well, Play It Yourself Board Game says, love those indented boards. Mm -hmm. And RVP Junker writes, I need to try this with my kids. I think they'd love it. Boxing Board Game says, that's a good looking game. And Miss Puffin Luck comments, wow, I didn't realize it's so cute. Well, thanks all of you for these comments. And I got to say, it really is a great looking game. And thankfully, it plays just as good as it looks. Now, finally, Silicon Sicilian says, one thing I would mention is that I disagree with the final remark in your review. The game feels very incomplete to me without the expansion. From what I've seen in other videos where it isn't used, others are feeling the same way. They just don't appear to be vocalizing that as much. Well, thanks for the feedback, Silicon Sicilian. Um, this is specifically about Sean's comment that tossing all the expansion content into the base game could be overwhelming with new players, which I got to say I agree with in general. But I can also see how it would have been nice to include that content in the base box, but then have a section saying only add this after learning the game. Now, we played the game a handful of times without the expansion before even opening it up and knowing what's in there. And I got to say, the only thing that really felt incomplete was the fact there were obvious spots on the player boards for the boots and no boots to go there. That just felt like the boots were missing. Other than that, though, I, I didn't feel like we were missing out on anything by not using the expansion. Honestly, in my ideal world, the boots would have just been in the base game and all the other stuff, the ballistas and the familiars and that would have been a saved in a separate expansion. I just wish they had put the boots in the base game because, yeah, there is that little feeling of, well, obviously there's a spot here. Something should fit. Why, why isn't there anything to fit there? Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're normally here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, that question boils down to what have you been playing lately? So as most of you probably noticed, uh, we didn't record a new podcast episode last week, and that's due to the fact that Deanna and I had our first vacation in almost three years. Uh, due to this, we didn't get to do a weekly wrap-up last week. Now, in addition to having games to talk about from two weeks ago, because we didn't do a wrap-up last week, and the fact Deanna and I got in some vacation gaming, some two-player games, John also made it into Windsor since the last time we were here, and we played a bunch of games while he was down. So we want to talk about those. Now, originally, when I sat down to script this episode where we were talking about it on the weekend, I was tempted to do a Sean Con wrap-up, as if we went to a game convention, as today's segment, and just talk about those games. But Deanna convinced me it'd be better just talk about all the stuff we played since the last time we were here, instead of splitting it into two different parts of the show, where one, we're talking about Sean Khan, and then later in the Bellhops tabletop, we're talking about everything else. So that's what we're here doing now. We are going to talk about everything we played, Sean Khan and vacation games, and some games we played with the family. Lots of gaming going on with some thoughts on each of these games. Now, we're going to be talking about these games in the chronological order we played them in. And due to that, a couple of games will get mentioned more than once. Yeah, this seemed worth doing um, in particular with one specific game, but it fit for a couple of them because our thoughts changed as we logged more plays over the last couple of weeks, in one case quite significantly. Now, for these short reviews, I'm going to be the one sharing my thoughts on the games played with Deanna and the family, but I'm going to hand over the reins to Sean for the Sean Con games just to mix things up a bit, keep things interesting, and so we kind of share the work. One final note before we start, some of the games mentioned tonight are puzzle-style games or legacy games, 
and we will be being careful mm -hmm. to not spoil anything while talking about them. And trust me, if we do let slip a little bit of info, it's nothing that's going to ruin the gameplay experience. We're only going to try to maybe give you a little tips to make the games a little more fun if you haven't played them yourself. So the first game to cover tonight is The Goonies, Escape with One-Eyed Willie's Rich Stuff, a Coded Chronicles game. Yes, that is the full name of the game. I currently don't think there is a board game with a longer name, especially when you throw in the A Coded Chronicles game part, which supposedly is part of the title. All the other Coded Chronicles do that. Uh, this is the latest Coded Chronicles game, which is a follow-up to The Shining Escape from Overlook Hotel, which had some issues, and the fantastic Scooby-Doo Escape from Mystery Mansion. All of these are by, by um, Jay Cormier and Sen Fun Lim. Now, this is a super fun system, and we mm -hmm. love what Jay and Sen have developed, as well as being glad to see that whatever happened to The Shining didn't hurt the format or kill the entire system and stop it from having more releases, which yes. can, in this case, apparently revitalize what could have dropped off a cliff. And for information on what happened with The Shining, we do have a reviewer on the blog. We're not going to dwell on that here. Check that out if you get a chance. So this is an escape room in a box style game that's broken into three chapters. And at this point, we've only finished the first chapter. So far, it's extremely well done. It's, it's everything I want in a Coded Chronicle game. Now, one big change compared to the other games is there are way more characters to play here. Like The Shining, you only had two. Scooby-Doo, you had the Scooby gang, which I, now I fail without counting them. Five people, I think, in the Scooby gang or four. I think it's five. Yeah, I think it's five with the five counting Scooby. I may be off on that. I may be forgetting a critical Scooby character here. But like this one, like there are eight characters, I think it was total. So even with six players, when we played it, some of us had to double up on books. Now, if you are going to play this game and you have less than a full eight players, um, here's some tips for you. Again, not really giving anything away. First off, data and mouth play differently than the other characters, and because of that, have very little text to read during the game. Mikey, on the other hand, the main character, of course, has a lot. So I suggest one player only do Mikey, only take the Mikey book. And the data and mouth get paired with other characters to get shared around. Though I do have to say, if you have a player who's tentative about reading out loud or taking part in that way, you may want to give them both data and mouth because they will have less to read. Trust me, they'll still have plenty to do. All right, well, certainly good to keep track of such things. And that's not altogether unexpected, given the movie. Yep. And you can probably figure out what those characters do if you've seen The Goons. And speaking of the movie, uh, this follows it. I, I, I very exactly, I would almost say, very, very closely, um, line by line dialogue. You will be reading out actual scenes from the movie. You will be, I, I, I almost want to say acting it out. If you're into voice acting, you can definitely go with that. Um, though I got to say, knowing the movie hasn't spoiled anything. Um, interestingly, the puzzles aren't solved identically. So I, again, I don't want to spoil anything. And you definitely don't need to know the movie to enjoy this but I'm certain it's helping to enjoy it. I don't think without knowing the Goonies, you would like fall in love with this. For one, it would probably feel like way too much reading to set up scenes because you'd be like, okay, just get me to the puzzles because it spends a lot of time setting up scenes. As for the puzzles so far, they've been just difficult enough. Um, and one thing I do want to call out is this one game, this particular series of Coded Chronicles games really encourages you to try all the abilities with all the things. So the way the Coded Chronicles works is each character has an ability. You pair that ability with things on the map, we'll just say, um, and then look up a thing in a book and read it, right? It's kind of a unique way to do which way. Well, in this case, there, there doesn't seem to be any reason not to try all the things, even if they don't necessarily logically make sense. Now, another tip is do not worry about using the first clues in any room. This is not cheating. You don't get penalized for the first clue you use for any puzzle. They're all just set up to make sure you understand what the puzzle is and that you have everything you need to solve. Like they're really there to make sure you understand what the game is trying to present to you and not actually to help you solve anything. So do not, you get no penalty. Anytime you're a little confused, 
just read that first entry. And it's always written in character. And it's, it's just kind of a make sure this person does this or remember that this person's ability is this and just kind of makes it obvious in case you miss something. Now, there are second and third clues as well, and doing those will penalize you. And another thing I do want to throw in there is there's a really neat timing mechanic that, of course, is tied to the Fratellis. So far, we're digging the Goonies Escape with one eye. Willie's rich stuff. I'm not going to say the full name and looking forward to playing more. That's great. And again, once again, again though, we are fans of the Goonies movie yes. who are enjoying this. Uh, I do think that there's a possibility your mileage will vary if you aren't a fan or even at all familiar with right. the Goonies movie. What you're not going to need is any information from the movie to solve anything in this. And that you is don't, clear. Yeah, you don't need to rewatch it to make sure and, you know, make sure you remember everything about the movie. Yes. Now, next up was three plays of Charterstone. This was on Deanna's birthday. Um, all I can say without spoiling things is, wow. Um, a lot of stuff happened in those games and at the end of those games. Um, these games, we unlocked a ton of new stuff. And honestly, for a bit, for one game, I would say, for one game, it actually felt overwhelming. There was suddenly so much new stuff and decks of cards that were almost empty suddenly looked like a, one of my dad's magic decks. There, there were just these crazy stack of cards and all new stuff coming out. And every round, someone was either opening a crate or building a building and our charters were all filling up and there were so many new choices. Now it's not like, oh, I have to choose from one of six, well, I guess it'd be 12. One of 12 worker placement spots. Now suddenly it's whatever, six times six plus six. So seven times six worker placement spots to pick from. Um, it was a little overwhelming, but like for one game, like like there was there was a bridge game. There was a game we unlocked a bunch of stuff. And the next game was kind of like, oh, I don't even know what's going on. But then we got back into the flow of things. Um, I've really been digging the way the goal of each game changes. So that's kind of neat. Like, despite the fact the game does play similar, every game you play, the, the kind of end goal changes. And I've really enjoyed the temporary rules that have been added with this. Uh, for example, the fact you have two different size meeple does matter at one point, which I don't think is a spoiler because everyone's going to be like, well, why would they give us two different size meeple if it doesn't? Trust me, it happens. Uh, the biggest shock to us, though, of the whole campaign so far, was the end of game six. Now, I don't want to spoil anything, but I will say that as a surprise birthday gift, at the end of this game, Deanna can no longer win the overall campaign, at least for now. Indeed, this, this whole set of games was a pretty big deal. And it's worth noting that playing three games at a time may not be your best choice. Uh, you don't necessarily want to rush to end this game and get it done. Let it breathe, let things play out, uh, recover after a, a, a game that has maybe <laughs> been overwhelming. Uh, but uh, we'll be talking about Mort and Charterstone again in a little bit. So now we get on to some vacation gaming. Uh, again, this is Deanna and I out of town. Uh, hotel rooms, brew pubs, restaurants, stuff like that. Had a great week, week, I guess. I don't know, it was midweek break. Um, the first game we played, though, was Racco. Yes, the classic mass market game about sorting 10 cards by number. Now, I'm personally a longtime fan. Uh, my grandmother taught me how to play Racco years and years ago. I don't even remember when. Um, my parents had a copy of the game. And even tonight, we were brought up. Racco came up at the dinner table. And my mom was like, oh, that's a good game. I can't believe you don't have a copy of that. But Deanna actually had never played it. So when I, we happened to notice they had, Set a brewery, happened to notice I had games on my way to the washroom. And on the way back, I grabbed it. And I'm like, hey, let's play Racco. And she's like, I've never actually played this. I don't think I played this. And then I taught her how to play. And she's like, no, I have definitely never played this. Racco, though, st seriously, though, is, is really a solid game. Um, the big thing that caught me, because, again, I hadn't played this in years, was just how good it still is. Because there's so much more going on than you expect. Like, to play Racco well you really have to watch what numbers your opponents take, possibly more importantly, where they put them on their rack and also what they're discarding. And actually trying to keep track of all that, especially with a few pints of beer, isn't always easy. Um, the only problem we have with Racco is that this was way too long. Um, the version we had didn't offer a reward for completing a rack. So getting 500 points actually took us like almost three hours. Which was fine because, well, we were at a brewery and we didn't mind closing the place while playing Racco. 
Now, interestingly, it seems the rules have varied over time as I pulled up a rule book online the other day while we were talking about mm. this, and it had some different uh, sort of indications than the rule book you guys had with your copy of the game. So it may be worth Googling for a rule book if you're sitting down to play, even if you've got one included. Yeah. Next up was a game off our pile of shame. Uh, it's The Blood of an Englishman from Renegade Game Studios, which I got to say for years, I've heard about this two player game. It never clicked in that that was a quote from Jack and the Beanstalk. I totally missed somehow that Blood of an Englishman was a game about Jack the Giant Killer. Uh, this is a 100% open information card game. One player plays Jack, the other plays the Giant. You start off with a grid of five uh, columns of 10 cards, and there's a mix of treasures, beanstalks that are numbered one through nine, and fee the words fee fi fo fum. Each turn, players are going to manipulate these cards, and it's very asymmetric. Now, Jack is trying to build three beanstalks of six height going up sequentially, and after he builds one, he then has to grab one of the three treasures. He has to do that three times, grabbing the three different treasures. The giant, on the other hand, is trying to manipulate the board so it either says, has all four words, fee fi fo fum in the same column, or at the front of four of the rows. Really solid game. Um, I got to say, reading it didn't make sense. So if you've read the rules for this and it seems overly complicated, just sit down and do it. Once you start manipulating those cards, they make perfect sense. But wow, is this game thinkier? Like this is one of those chess-like games where you're trying to plan multiple turns ahead, outmaneuver your opponent, potentially even bluffing and fainting, hoping they think you're doing one thing when you do another. Now the giant has less moves, and only actually has two different moves, but they're extremely powerful and can generally focus on just the words, right? The giant's kind of doing their own thing. Whereas Jack not only has to worry about building his beanstalks and trying to get his treasures, he has to try really hard to make sure the giant doesn't win. And the two play very differently because of that. Really well-designed game, expertly done. Um, I actually recommend it for two-player games, for two players who want a challenging experience, something where you're, you're literally putting your strategy up against your opponents. It just wasn't the kind of game we wanted for a relaxing middle of the afternoon vacation game where we're just kind of hanging out in the hotel and the TV's on and the difference and we're talking about what we're going to do later in the day. It just didn't fit what we were trying to do, but that wasn't the game's fault. That was more of a, I didn't realize how tactical and strategic this game was going to be. Yeah, it's always a tough balance for those two player games to find something that gets engaging enough but that doesn't kill the conversation or worse, ramp up the competition to unhealthy yes. levels. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't try this one at night after we'd had a couple of drinks. I'm, I'm glad this was a mid-afternoon relaxation game. Now, the next game we played was the game. That is the game from Pandasaurus. Um, I mentioned a few weeks back about how I kind of hooked the end on this one at two players, how I totally sold her on it. And it, it stands up surprisingly good with only two people like it works good with multiple but it is a really good two-player experience and what was funny is we returned the next night to the same brewery we were at the night before and i thought it'd be ironic to now play the game because i'm like they're both about playing cards in order from well one's from one to 40 the other's one to 100 but it just to me was ironic i don't think anyone else got the joke but hey it made me laugh um so we played the game i don't think i need to explain how to play the game we've talked about it multiple times on the show you can look it up i uh, it is just a really solid game that night, we played multiple rounds, had some more beers, and we had our best two-player game yet. While we've never cleared the deck, we still haven't done that with two players, we did get down to eight cards left. And according to the rules, anything 10 cards or less is considered a win. Yeah. We just didn't get a complete win. Relationship goals. Beating the game. It'll happen at some point. Now, the last game we played during our far too short break was Aqualin. I gotta say, it plays rather well on a bed. Now, Deanna really digs this two-player abstract tile laying game and kicked my butt as usual. Uh, while I could blame the fact that I ate far too much of Jack's chicken schnitzel that day, uh, she cuts my butt in Aqualine all the time anyway. Um, we didn't actually bring this one out of the hotel room, but I still think this would be a great coffee shop or bar game. And I got to admit, I considered bringing it out when I grabbed the game instead. We could have easily been playing some Aqualine. And what I find fascinating about this one is I still haven't beaten Deanna, 
but she gets beat all the time by my daughter. And the time I sat down with my daughter, I beat her twice in a row. So there's obviously some different strategies in this game that work. Maybe there's a rock, paper, scissor thing going on. I haven't figured out what that is to be able to actually um, cash in on it, but we are still digging Aqualin. And and I got to say, when we do a games to take on vacation list, I think this one's going to get up there. I'd say we could do a games you can play in bed episode, but I don't think that would get us the kind of traffic we really want. I, I, we talked about the rebranding we're thinking of doing with Tabletop Bellhop. That might <laughs> fit for that. <laughs> uh, insider joke for those of you who were at Sean Khan. Speaking of Sean Khan, we now move to Sean Khan. The games we played while Sean was down here in Windsor for a couple days. Now, first up, uh, we actually have an Excel file where we track stuff that while we're talking on the podcast, Sean goes, oh, I really need to play that. I throw it in an Excel file because then when he comes down, I can bring it up and I, and I remember because otherwise I'll totally forget. And on that list was Disney Villainous because uh, Sean wanted to try it to see if your kids would dig it. Plus, my daughter really wanted to play some games with the adults because uh, my youngest daughter was away at her grandmother's. So my oldest daughter was home. She's like, I want to play some games with the adults, too. So we set up a four player game of Villainous. Um, who do we have? Prince John, Hook, the Queen of Hearts, and Jafar. Yep. I think were the villains we used. Yeah, it yep. took me a minute. So what do you think of Villainous? You know what? I, I was really surprised, as I think most people who play this game for the first time would be. Mm-hmm. It's a game. It's a real hobby game, dripping with choices and asymmetry and a need to really watch your opponents as well as plan for yourself. Uh, it, it feels like at a glance that this could easily be a, a kind of throwaway, you know, mass market. It's Disney, right? It's a licensed game. Yeah. Licensed games are meh, but it absolutely isn't. And now I can also see why there are so many expand alone versions mm-hmm. of this. I can really easily seeing it being one where you want to try them all. Um, although I do, I suspect you would probably end up with favorites. And mm-hmm. if you were to, you know, do the whole collect them all thing, it'd be a lot of villains who just didn't get played. Probably. Um, but it's, it's, it was great fun. It was great. Finally, you know, playing a game that wasn't just a uh, uh, Hogwarts battle with your daughter and <laughs> uh, good to see her at the table uh, joining us now. Yeah, I totally agree. As it is, I have to convince my daughter not to play Maleficent. So <laughs> I have a feeling if we had nine more villains to choose from, I think there's even more than that out. I think there might be four expansions now, so 12 more villains. Might be even more than that. Um, I, I think she'd still want to play Maleficent every game. Now, are the are the non-Disney ones compatible? Like, Can you play no. the Marvel with the... No, okay. the Marvel and the new Star Wars that's coming out will not be compatible either. Well, see, that's a shame. Yeah, I thought the same thing because I thought you'd be able to actually like, you know, play whatever Iron Man versus yeah. or, I no, you play villain. So I, <laughs> Thanos versus Maleficent or whatever. Yeah, but no, no, that would make a lot of sense. I, I don't know. From what I understand, they changed the rules. And mm. someone has asked me before if I checked out the Marvel and I have not because I've heard it's not as good. And I will admit, I don't love Villainous. I think it's a very well designed game. I think it's an interesting game. It's engaging. There's just other stuff I'd rather play. That is a game I play with my daughter because she loves it. Absolutely. And it, it, yeah, it's not the best game we played all of Sean Cod, but it was a great game. And because I think a lot of uh, of it was because how much it exceeded the expectations yeah. of a licensed game, a licensed game. Yeah. And this is the like this came. This is Prospero Hall. We now love Prospero Hall. But back when this came out, I didn't know who Prospero Hall was. Yeah. So next up, we have what's potentially the best game of Sean Khan. We'll let Sean be the final verdict on that. My favorite game of Sean Khan, I think. And that is Lost Ruins of Arnak. Uh, this is another one you really wanted to try badly, though you have been playing it on Board Game Arena. So it's new to you, sort of. Right. So, yeah, as we said, we've been playing this, I think, four or five times now on Board Game Arena. I don't know yeah, if we finished all turn. of those. <laughs> but uh, I haven't really actually had a teach until now. Right. And I think more importantly, online, you miss so much of the table talk that might clue you into either other people's plans or even actions and options that you didn't realize for whatever reason that you could do uh, mm-hmm. either now or later or, you know, on another turn. So more than anything, what I'm really hoping is that this physical play will really help my digital play improve. Now, I... I knew I liked Arnak. I I knew that I was missing some things. And so I wasn't playing well and that's fine. 
uh, I definitely sort of clued into, I think, most of the, the little bits and pieces I'd missed along the way. And it is still an absolutely solid game. Mm -hmm. I think, if anything, the uh, theme of the game doesn't super resonate with me. Um, but that doesn't make it less of a fun of a game. It's just I tend to gravitate towards science fiction games. Mm. And so uh, you give me a deck building worker placement science fiction game, for instance, and I might possibly drift more towards that one than this. But you just have to think of it as Indiana Jones and whatever the crystal skulls. And then you, you get to combine both together. With your <laughs> and arm. then I throw it through a window, set it on <laughs> fire. <laughs> so I got a question. Well, by, by table talk, do you mean like just walking through your turn? Like, okay, I'm going to go here. That'll give me a spear and a, or a weapon and a thing. And then I'm going to tap my, I'm using tap. So I guess we figured out that's okay. I'm going to tap my my researcher to turn that spear into a ruby, which is going to let me move up this thing. Part Partly that, but also, you know, the little, the sort of like, oh, shoot, I could have done that in next turn. So next turn, I'm going to, you know, be, people just talking at the table about yeah. about the general gameplay. And, and you, you, you took catch... my spot. Yeah, Dang it. I, yeah, I yeah. was going to buy that because I could do this and this with it. Yeah, yeah. Just, just sort of the, you know, the general chatter about a game that happens at a table, uh, not specific, anything specific. But, you know, when you're playing a game, you often talk about what you're doing, what's going on. Oh, that's kind of fascinating. There, there you go. There's a topic of uh, something that gets we could we could. I wonder if we want to do a whole episode on that. We have other people's questions to answer besides mine. But um, what gets lost when at the virtual tabletop? Like I, I think that could be an interesting topic, and that's one I hadn't even considered. Like, yeah, she missed the socialization, but I had never thought of the fact that you're missing out on the the gameplay commentary. I guess while yep. you're playing. So I was lost. Ruins of Arnak. After that, Tori and Kat showed up, and I cracked open an advanced copy of the Glory expansion for Draconis Invasion, and we checked that out for the first time. Now, we're going to be doing a full review of this one later in the show, and I'll be sharing most of my thoughts then. So what are some of your quick thoughts you had on this modular expansion for the fantasy deck builder Draconis Invasion? Now, we know this is only a preview. This isn't mm -hmm. the, final, the final release, and while it added, really nicely to the game giving it some of that much beloved asymmetry that we always talk about uh something new to think about while buying and some new scoring options there were some things that it could have done better so it's an overall improvement but i think we need to wait and see what the kickstarter brings yeah. and what the final version of this looks like before we can really give any sort of final uh, opinion on this overall though definitely trending positive and yep. from what we know or have heard is going to be happening in the kickstarter i think it's going to keep trending positive based on that sounds good that was the glory expansion coming soon for draconis invasion next we move on to what i'm going to turn the biggest mess of the weekend um and that was two plays of the tales from the loop board game from free league publishing uh, despite what we're about to say, thank you, Free League, for sending us a copy of this game to check out. Um, I've shared some of my concerns with this game already. So what did you have to say having to get to try to explore Simon Stalinhog's world of the 80s that never was? So it is beautiful. It's got some great feeling pieces and components. Uh, the content is so thematic. The scenarios have a ton of story to them and things going on. It's a shame, though, because so far the game itself has just plain sucked. Uh, <laughs> we often say co-op should be hard. You shouldn't mm -hmm. be winning most of the time. And if you are winning more than 50% of the time, it may be broken or at least below your level. And, and you know, you, you, you should be aiming for a, a harder game or turning up the difficulty. However, on the other end of the scale, if you are suddenly break out calculators and you still aren't sure how you could possibly win the game after trying it multiple times with different options, it also might be broken. Yeah. Um, I've got a lot more to say about this game. Once we get to the end of this segment where I'll be sharing some further thoughts after trying it with only three players. Uh, but for now, that was our not-so-great experiences with the Tales from the Loop board game. 
Now, since Tori and Kat were over, um, and we're going to be reviewing Charter Stone once we finish the campaign, we actually don't have that far to go now. And I wanted Sean to at least see the game, touch the components, see what it looks like, see how the basic gameplay flows. Uh, we decided to sit down and play through a game of our campaign. Now, I'll admit, I wanted Sean to stay for two. I wanted to play through two games, so at least he got the level up experience and the carrying over. Um, but I also wanted to see what happens when you add a new charter to the game. But I'll talk about that in a, in a bit. What I want to know is, what were your thoughts on Charter Stone now that you've actually seen more than other people's reviews, basically? So, so yeah, honestly, I really wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, I didn't know much about the game, as we've been trying not to spoil anything, so aside from the vague ideas from the unboxing um, and hearing a little bit about what's played out sort of on a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I had read reviews, but again, that's still pretty high level. The reviews yeah. don't generally try to spoke. I was pretty much going in blind. Now that said, even stepping in blind, it was really easy to pick up how to play mm -hmm. and jump in. Uh, the biggest problem I found was that I was constantly nervous as someone who was just going to be there for one game, that I might mess up their campaign. Now, it turns out that's not much of a concern at all. So I do encourage others to jump in if they can, based on my experience in, in trying that one little chance. It's fun. And uh, and again, you're not going to break things if you no. go, get out there and play. So go ahead and do it. Yeah, that's a big thing I was trying to encourage Sean. I'm like, don't worry about it. It's going to be all good. This isn't that kind of game. Not like you, I, I don't even know, like Pandemic Legacy feels like you could do something wrong and lose a content or something if you jumped in for one game. That's not going to happen in Charter Stone. Now, as for some thoughts on the um, adding a player partway through, it worked. I, I didn't see a problem with it. Um, again, I was hoping to get in two games so we got to see a little bit more of it. Um, the one thing that was just weird to me, though, is I hadn't read the rules for adding a charter until the, the day of the event. And I was not expecting such loosey goosey suggestions versus rules, especially from Stonemire, right? Like this, this is the, the dude who did charter stone. Like you expect some firm and ha fast rules. Like one of the rules is like, give the new character a fair amount of glory. doesn't really tell you what that is. So we kind of all just sat down and we took an average of our glory and gave that to Sean. And I can see this causing some consternation with groups who are all about points and winning. And I know those groups are out there. I played with some of those. For us, though, we didn't really care. We're like, here, have some, have the average. It's also very vague about starting cards. So, like, give them one building card, built or not. But then basically says, if they've marked off capacity for more cards, give them more cards. Let them pick cards, randomly do them. It was just weird that it wasn't codified. Yeah, it's very strange to have such uh, abstract things because especially if I, because I was just joining for one game, it doesn't really matter. But if I was joining to continue the campaign, this could have actually mattered uh, and it would have been more concerning perhaps to people. I mean, again, we were all pretty easy going about it, but, you know, I can definitely see how it would be more of a concern. You don't want to boost them up too little so they can't possibly win or boost mm -hmm. them up so much so that they all of a sudden are killing everybody. So again, the way Charterstone plays, even if we gave you too much, if you've got too many resources, too many cards, you destroyed that game, that's all gone at the end of the game. To do the reset system and the storage system, and again, I'm not going to get into detail. This isn't even really spo spoilers, but you're only allowed to carry over so much. And I think as long as those numbers are in league with everyone else, Maybe one game, maybe one game you did a little wrong and someone gets in a bit of an advantage, but you know what? That Maybe that's the reward for joining the group partway through and helping you finish the campaign. Um, now, I do find it interesting that Sean happened to show up. So we had never played Charter Zone, so we didn't know what was going to happen at the end of this game. Uh, he happened to show up for a game that's going to have a significant impact on the final game scoring. So that's interesting. That, that should should be be interesting. Again, not a huge impact. Uh, there, there's one card that's now out of play. And what I've done so far is we've left Sean's charter open just in case he makes it back down before we finish the campaign. Uh, we are taking a couple weeks off just because of other things going on in our lives. So if he happens to make it down, we'll let him jump back in. Yeah, and maybe next time I can try harder to mess things up <laughs> for the rest of you. That's all good. You, you got to make the king happy for us at some point because we seem to be really pissing off the king a lot, <laughs> which I still swear he's a bad guy. We'll see. Uh, that was a 
Charterstone and the end of Sean Con day one. Day two was shorter. Now, Sean had to drive home that night, uh, home to Hamilton. But we started off with Dune Imperium, uh, which you seem to really enjoy. So we played multiple rounds. Indeed. Uh, to be fair, I am both a Dune and sci-fi in general fan. So this game was going to come with starting with an advantage in that way. But mm -hmm. being a deck builder with far more options and opportunities only helped establish it as a really fun one. Uh, I really enjoy the variety of play options mm -hmm. and how well there is an asymmetry in which uh, faction or uh, character you choose. It doesn't feel hugely overpowered as it's a very subtle ability mm -hmm. you get most of the time. Uh, and that suits the theme very well. Overall, I think the game feels like the political intrigue that it's meant to represent. That is really yeah. sort of the undercurrent of the Dune universe. And that's just something that so many games never seem to achieve is that that intrigue and 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 and, and backstabbing without being overt about it. Yep. Honestly, um, you putting it that way makes me think a lot of people like to compare this game to Lost Ruins of Arnak, which I'll ask you about in a second. But I'm almost thinking a better comparison might even be um, Lords of Waterdeep just because of those intrigue cards and the competing over various spots and activating different buildings. There's a lot of overlap there. Even with the number of agents you have, heck, the meeples even look somewhat <laughs> similar. Um, and you're collecting cubes, which, again, looks a little the same. Now, I, as we've mentioned a few times while talking about this game, everyone likes to compare this to Lost Ruins Arnak. So where, where are you on the Arnak versus Dune scale i don't know what they're talking about i i posted this on twitter while we were playing i i don't get it i mean yes there are cards and there are worker placements bots but it pretty much ends there i don't i don't see any real comparison <laughs> they just they unfortunately from well, i guess came out at the same point yeah well fans are going to want to know if you had to pick one or the other it's going to be dune dude there you go now, personally, all I have to say uh, about Dune so far, because I've only played the game three times, is wow, is it better with three players? Um, first time I played the games with Deanna, and I did not enjoy playing it two players enough that I would say this weekend redeemed the game. Like I was having a hard time convincing Deanna to even try it again. She had kind of already given up on it. And now having played with three players twice, um, much more interested in spending more time with this game and that's not just because i won both games <laughs> which doesn't happen all that often that was dune imperium from direwolf no obligation there that's from our collection so we're not heaping love on a pile of obligation game there so the final game of the first sean con of 2022 was underwater cities uh the terraforming mars killer to many um, while I admit the teach was bad, the teach was rough. I spent a lot of time going through the rule book, basically speed reading it so that I could point out the information. Uh, even though I'd played it before, once we started playing, it went pretty quick. Like I, I was surprised how quick it went from, you know what, I'm going to just teach you the basics. And if anything comes up, I'll explain it to it actually working. So besides the rough teach, what do you think of underwater cities? You know what? It's fun. Uh, I find it more of an engine builder. Uh, or, or focused on the engine building than Terraforming Mars is. Uh, and that mm. sort of puts it into a, into a slightly different category than Terraforming Mars. Uh, and they are, I mean, yes, they are both engine builders, but it it felt more, um, you know, more towards gizmos on the engine building scale okay. than, than Terraforming Mars did. Um, the biggest downfall to me of uh, Underwater Cities are the components. Um, it's just, you know, every almost everything about it the only fun thing about it are the little domes <laughs> those are cool uh but kind of every other component <laughs> sort of lets the game down um personally i think this one could be a complete home run as a digital implementation done well well uh okay. with its own app as opposed to something just on bga um, and, and it would allow people to really double down on the theme and play with it graphically as well as removing what is a lot of fiddliness in playing that game. I mean, even just stacking the smooth rounded uh, yeah. research stations on top of each other and trying not to send them flying. <laughs> yeah, there are definitely um, uh, uh, 
Rio Grande games has obviously progressed. It's all, not all wooden cubes and, and, <laughs> and, and tubes, but uh, it, it definitely is a dated feeling game for a game that's not that old. Deanna was like, no, no, it's older than you think. It's like 2015, 20 this. I'm like, no, no, 2019. Yeah. Like just pre-pandemic. <laughs> game probably would have got more buzz if it wasn't for the pandemic. Now, I did see, and I'm trying to get confirmation on this, there is an expansion. I think it might come with double-layer boards, which I got to say gives you at least something to put the discs in, but it's still not going to help with that stacking problem. It doesn't seem like it would have been that hard to make some kind of chips that stack as opposed to those, I don't even know what you call those, little round plastic things. That yeah. The cubes might stack better. Well, I mean, even if you just indented, like, so basically pushed push one, one side through so yes. that it was pointed so on were, one yeah. side and, and indented on the other, and then they could stack together. Uh. Yeah, I, I, it, there, there are definitely some design choices. I try to overlook them, though. I, I find it a really fascinating, neat game. But the biggest problem is we don't haven't played it enough, and I think that's going to be a game that's going to get better once you know the cards, what cards can come up, especially with what Deanna did. Like, what's in that specialist deck oh, would yeah. really help to know what's there. Um, but something about the game is forgettable like like i played this before and it felt like i never had playing it like the iconography didn't make sense and like by the end of the game it was all making sense but i just have a feeling the next time we play underwater cities i'm going to be looking up the rule book again and going wait a minute yeah that's right this is the game where you pick a spot and if your card matches you get an extra thing but what the heck's this mean and what's bonus action and what's this do and what's this symbol yeah i felt i i, I think i said on on our way out that if I played this again within two weeks, I'd probably be okay. But any more than that, and I'd need to teach again. There's yeah. just there, the iconography is not ideal. Uh, and yes, uh, Underwater City's New Discoveries has the double sided board. But again, you, it, stacking research stations is still stacking research stations. Yeah. But the rest of the stuff, like all the tunnels have a spot they lock into, and the first yeah. research station has a spot. I gotta say, they look really nice. I was like, ooh, I want those boards. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> they come with the expansion. And I'm like, oh, I'll have to look into that. Yeah. And I guess say more cards would always be good, though. It must, I must like it if I'm thinking after two plays, I'm, I should get the expansion. So <laughs> it's gotta be something it's doing right there. It's it's also a, ta a bit of a table hog, um, depending yes. on how, depending on how you, and even though the main board is no Arnak. Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, but, but part the, of the, the problem your tableau. Is, part of the problem is your tableau because the icons aren't as clear as they could be you want to have the both the icons and the text visible yeah. so you end up spreading out more and more and more as you build build your engines and it doesn't have the nice color coding of terraforming mars like blue cards or green cards are actions and blue cards are always in play or whatever it is for terraforming mars yeah where Terraforming Mars, you can basically bury the cards, like your standard yet orange cards. Once you play them, all you need are those tags up in the corner. I couldn't do that with this. I like I'll admit I played twice, so I was a little better at that, and I found a way to kind of organize my cards. And the tableaus so far haven't been as big as Terraforming Mars. Right. Like you don't have as many cards in play, but then the board's smaller. So I honestly I think the the, the footprint's probably about the same as a five player game at Terraforming Mars. Yep. All right. This leads to my last game play of the last couple weeks and that was giving tales from the loop one more shot over at brenda and holly's where we played a three-player game uh this time trying the light fantastic scenario and i have evolving thoughts so first off i truly do not understand why the light fantastic isn't the default starter scenario now the actual one in the game is bottom up which has you dealing with all of the different robot types in the game Lots of hacking, which is probably the most fiddly and complex part of the game. Multiple branching storyline with multiple ways to win and lose. Multiple new locations showing up on the board. And pretty much the kitchen sink of stuff in the game. And maybe they were trying to highlight this as, here's the scenario that has it all. If you want the full Tales from the Loop experience, play this. I think it's a terrible choice. Yeah, there are honestly a number of things I don't really grasp about the choices that they made in this game. <laughs> now, on the other hand, the late fantastic compared to bottom muck starts with, I don't want to spoil anything. Your parents are preoccupied, so you don't have to do chores. You don't even need the chore deck. You don't use it. You don't need to be home for dinner on time. You don't even have the tracker for how happy your family is to keep track of. And while unfortunately you don't get rides, but for all the stuff you throw, what this does is it, it removes a whole 
mini game from the game. A whole sub process of the game is removed, which not only makes the game easier to learn, it also gives you more time. You no longer have to use a cube. You can no longer be grounded. Nothing is going to take up two of your cubes. You can actually complete more actions and have more ability to complete the things to do to the scenario. And the scenario itself is simpler and more linear. There is one way to win and one way to lose. And it's very traditional for an RPG style um, adventure. I don't want to spoil it, but there's like a big boss battle style hack that honestly does a fantastic job of actually showing off those rules as a subset at the end after you've learned everything else. Like, this is just, it, it, I, anyone who buys this game, start with the light fantastic. It is so much better an onboarding experience. Added to that, the scenario actually seemed very winnable. Not that we did win, but it did come down to a final series of rules that we actually took a chance on. We were like, okay, are we going to split up and do this and this? Or you know what? Or all of us concentrate our actions on this one spot. Uh, Sean's played before, so he'll know what I mean. Ignore all the rumors. Let's go all in on this thing, because I think if we finish this thing, we'll win the game. And, well, we failed the rules. And then because of the rumors and other things, we did end up failing. But there was definitely a good chance we could have won that scenario, which was very different from other scenarios indeed even thinking that it could be winnable seems like a massive improvement over yes. our prior plays and unfortunately that's not a good statement <laughs> no it's not uh winterfell 69 thanks for the follow um now one thing the scenario didn't fix is the brutal odds on these dice like a, a one in six chance on every die is terrible odds um, like I noted, we failed light fantastic. Well, we failed on a seven dice pool that was pushed. That statistically should not happen. Like it can, there is the pro probability, but man, like, like we did everything right. And that's one of my complaints with this game is you can do absolutely everything right. And it comes down to the dice and you fail. And this is very much based on the Tales from Loop role-playing game, which I fully understand. Obviously, the, the role players were trying to make a board game version of this. The difference is, is when you fail a role like that in a role-playing game, that means something interesting is going to happen. Not you just fail. You lost. The kids failed their role. You lost. If it was a role-playing game. The thing we were trying to hack might have went haywire and driven right through the school and we would have been out of school for three weeks and maybe someone might have broke a leg and ended up in the hospital, but then we'd have to deal with a rampaging robot and that would be our next scenario. You don't get that out of a board game. Indeed, I'd love to see a scaled success mechanic in this game, as currently the dice might as well have five blank faces. There's only one side on each dice ever matters well clarification it only matters in making skill checks because there are multiple things as we saw in this scenario where you're rolling the d6 to get random numbers from one to six so the the dice are used to generate random things okay. I, I, again i don't want to spoil anything. i hadn't run into that yet but okay yeah, so that's the, I, we had before too and in, in bottom up there is something it was a location on the board you went there and you rolled the d6 to see what happened but for a test, all that matters is that six. Right. Because and, and just just to point out to people, when we say a seven dice pool pushed, that means there is only a 23 percent chance of failure. Yep. <laughs> but even with seven dice, there's a 23 percent chance of failure. That's a lot for a board game. Yeah. And I, what, what are the odds on eight? Because eight is the max. Uh, I, I think it was like. I think it's like 15 or 13 or something like that. Always like a 15% chance you fail. Yeah. I don't, and like I said, that works in a role-playing game. That failure makes role-playing games interesting, especially the style of Tales from Luke, where your kids, you know you can't die. You, things getting more complicated just makes the game more fun. Yeah. All right. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is we try with three players. Uh, this, we thought, may be a big deal, and honestly, it was. Um, this seems to be the sweet spot. Despite the fact the rule book says, here's how to make the game harder if you're playing with four or more. I don't, did they not play test it at three and four or more? I don't even know. Um, only twice while playing did we have rumors bump off the board. And honestly, the second time it happened, it was a conscious choice for that potential. It was like, you know what? 
if we don't get at least a minus one card on the school, we're going to bump one, but that's fine. We can afford the Enigma. Even the turn where we weren't, th there was a turn where we only had two rumors up because we're playing three players and we drew a minus two card for the school day. We had one left from the last turn. So we went into a full turn of the game with only two rumors on the board. Now Sean's played a couple times and like that's just a completely different feel to the game. That combined with the fact that once you reduce the number of kids, your kids are better. So your kids now get five dice in their core skill and two in their skill they're terrible at. This meant it was way easier to split the kids up and still succeed. If you had a kid with an item that fit, you had six dice, which is really, well, about as good as you get in this game for the average roll. At this point, playing four or five and now three, I do think the game's literally broken at five players because of the way the rumor rules work. Because of the, 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 the school cards and the fact that with five players, there is, well, it, the, on the standard deck, there is only two minus twos in that entire deck. Other than that, if you don't draw those, you're going to wipe the rumors every turn. And with five players, you're not going to be able to complete them every turn, sometimes just because of distance on the board. So I, I honestly think it's broken. Like, I don't know what the fix is. Maybe every, with five players, everything's minus one. So you either get minus one number of players so, or minus two number of players or minus three, maybe. But even then, like, that's what we saw during the game. Sean played with us when you were down. Like, I am pretty convinced you can't win Firestarter with five players because of the requirements. And even worse is the videotape one, which I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of, but requiring 18 insight is ridiculous. Why is the insight higher for more players? Yeah. Like, I honestly think if you played through Firestarter and I haven't tested this, if you passed every role in the game, you may not be able to win. We thought about trying it with no dice just to see, is it even possible? Yep. So, uh, indeed, if the box says one to five players, it had better actually be playable and winnable at those player counts. Now, that's so Ryan oh, in yeah. the chat is pointing out that you have a guaranteed pair with seven six sided dice. The problem is, you're not looking for pairs, you are looking for sixes. Yep. All you need is one six on seven dice, and technically, it's one six on 14 dice when you push. Mm -hmm. We could not roll one six on 14 dice with a push and that's why we failed the one scenario so that's it for our thoughts on all of the games we've been playing lately <laughs> what have you been playing lately we'd love to hear about it in the comments below now we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions even if now and then we answer our own questions if you got a question for us head to the website click on ask the bellhop fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where I can be found as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our preview of the glory expansion for the fantasy deck builder, Draconis Invasion. Draconis Invasion Glory is a small box expansion for Draconis Invasion that will be launching on Kickstarter this spring in 2022. It was designed by Jeff Lai and features art from a variety of artists, including Amber Harris, Jeremiah Humphreys, Jack Kaiser, Alexander Koschenko, and Manthos Lapis. Assuming a successful crowdfunding campaign, it should be printed by Keji Inc. later in this year, expected to deliver in the same year. Now, this expansion does require you to own a copy of Draconis Invasion, and it is meant to be used in two to six player games, and honestly can speed up the playtime of the original game. Now, this is a small, slender deck of cards. And that's it. You're mm -hmm. not getting a new campaign or card layouts, just some new cards to use with your existing games. Correct. This small box expansion for Draconis Invasion will feature three new card types, asymmetric champion cards and game scoring bonus cards and invocation cards that add a totally new gameplay element. All of these are optional additions to the game that can be mixed and matched how you like. It's also worth noting that this expansion is fully compatible with the campaign-based Wrath expansion for Draconis Invasion. For a look at these new cards, I invite you to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, in regards to component quality, the artwork, layout, and card design all match the style and quality of the original. Now, I do appreciate there is some color used here other than just grays and blues, which was an issue we had with the base game. 
Now, one thing to note is that the final product should have more cards than what I show off in that unboxing video. I know for a fact additional bonus cards are planned as stretch goals for the Kickstarter, and I'm pretty sure more champions will also be a thing. Now that we have a good idea of what we'll be getting with the Glory expansion for Draconis Invasion, how about you tell us how you use these new cards? Okay, so as already mentioned, this expansion contains three new types of cards, champions, bonus cards, and invocation. During any game of Draconis Invasion, the base game, or using Wrath, you can toss in any of these expansions. And here's what each does. Champion cards add an element of asymmetry to the game. They are shuffled at the start of the game, and two are dealt to each player. Player look at these, choose one to keep, and then pass the other one to the player on the right. Both cards are then placed face down in front of the players. Now, each of these cards features a one-time use, rather powerful ability. For example, the Barbarian card lets you instantly defeat an invader with 20 or less hit points, or the Executioner, which lets you trash a treasure to remove three non-terror cards from your discard pile thinning your deck. Now, my advanced copy of this came with 12 champion cards in eight different types. More are planned as stretch goals for the Kickstarter. These were interesting, and they could have quite the impact on gameplay, but then you also knew a bit of what was coming thanks to the drafting mechanism, which helped somewhat in offsetting those surprises. Still, your plans can come crashing down if suddenly you're discarding your entire hand after having worked out some fun combos for your next turn. Next, we have the bonus cards. These add a end game storing element to the game. Each game, you'll randomly place a number of face-up bonus cards as part of the game setup. At the end of the game, players will score bonus points for matching the requirements on these cards. Now, these include things like the armed bonus, which gives two points to the player with the most defender cards in their deck at the end of the game, or the unafraid card that gives two points to the player with the least terror. Now, again, my preview copy of Glory came with six different bonus cards, and more are planned as stretch goals once the Kickstarter is live. While nice, the current six cards was a little underwhelming in a six-player game. Mm. So hopefully there will be more and you can enjoy the random selection of some of them to make it a tighter game with that scoring at the end. Now, the final card type included with Glory for Draconis Invasion is the Invocation card. There are six of these and they're all identical. At the start of the game, every player gets their own Invocation card. Now, what these cards let you do is store one card under them when you buy the card. That card can then be pulled out at any time on a later turn and added to your hand and then played. All right, well, now that we know what these cards do, let's get into what we thought about how each of them impact the play of Draconis Invasion. So sticking with the same order as before, champion cards, to me, were an interesting addition. Now, as most of you know, I really enjoy anything that adds asymmetry to a game, so I was really looking forward to these. Now, when I'd heard Jeff talking about adding asymmetric powers, being a deck builder, I totally expected new cards for each starting hand, right? Like new cards added to your deck at the beginning of the game that would come up multiple times while you were playing so that everyone's starting deck was different. And that's not what this is. I was totally not expecting separate one-time use kind of power-up cards. So I was a little surprised by the, the direction Jeff chose with this version of asymmetry. Now, I suspect that they wanted something that was powerful enough to be decisive while also avoiding the risk for being forced to potentially trash the card without ever using it or never having it in your hand when it's needed. Yeah, I can definitely see why they went this way. It just it was a shock to me. Most other deck builders I played with the asymmetry, uh, for example, we were talking about Dune, you've got that Signet Rig card, right? That's what I was expecting. That's not quite what we got. Now, what I did find while using these cards that the abilities are rather powerful. Um, I'd want to say game-breaking, but they're not because everyone has two of them, so everyone can break the game. So in that way, they're balanced, but quite a few of them include take that, penalize your opponent-style powers that can be quite the shock when first using them. Now, what we didn't do, and I strongly suggest, is have everyone just read all the cards before shuffling them so everyone knows what could potentially happen when using these cards. Right, and don't forget what you gave away to whom in the draft. Now, I liked how you knew what one card was. That is the one aspect of the draft I enjoyed. Like, I know I gave Deanna this card, and I know she can interrupt one of my combats to reduce 10 strength for me. So I am going to play so that I always have 10 extra strength whenever I attack. Like, that part was neat. 
You also know the card you have. And once you know the eight different cards, that gives you a pretty good idea of what other cards are probably in play. Um, no, we did play with six players, so they were almost all in play. No, how many were there? No, I don't think they were all in play, even with even with six players. So um, there was part of me, though, that kind of wished this information was not hidden. So you really could plan ahead so that I would know that Tori across the table has a way to make me discard my hand. And until he's done that, I should know not to worry too much about exactly building up combos. I think this is something some groups might want to house rule, perhaps having one card face up, one face down, or everyone reading off your cards at the start of the round, and then it's up to you to remember as it goes on. I can definitely see some variability uh, to the use of these cards based on the group. Absolutely. I, I have to say, personally, I'm pretty happy with the existing way of both face down, though I would definitely want to read them all oh, through yes. before playing again. I get during the game, there are also some take that mechanisms already mm -hmm. in the game. So a lot of what these cards do is just sort of double down on them. So yeah. instead of discarding two cards, you discard all of your cards. Uh, whereas, you know, you, but you can only do that twice versus almost every round you could discard down to yes. four in some with the way some people play. <laughs> yeah, I got to say, like when my daughter got backstabbed that one time, I think she was ready to quit the game. So yeah, knowing that, that was, was a possibility probably would have made her. Yeah, that one was harsh. Uh, next, we move to the bonus cards. I, I don't really have a lot to complain about here. They're a great addition to the game. The only thing I complain I have, and I think Sean has the same, is just don't use all of them every game. Uh, with our prototype copy, we were given six cards and told to use the number of cards equal to the number of players. So all six were in play. What I did like was how diverse these cards were. The, the, what the six different cards are were pretty cool. And when playing six players, it was at, at a point where everyone was able to claim at least one, which was kind of neat. They just kind of felt like everyone got something and not in a here's your trophy for, for coming out. I thought that was neat. A um, couple aspects I didn't like was the fact it was friendly ties, but just was bad for the math. Like I want the person who won, got the card to take the card and then they can just, when they're adding up their stuff, just add it up. So it was a little annoying trying to remember, okay, who got this one? Okay. You, you, and you scored this one and you, you, and you scored that one. I, a little minor. And I was a little concerned about the one for most campaigns completed because I, I haven't really tracked it in our plays of Draconis, but if you're able to complete a lot of campaigns, that generally means you're winning the game. And it's just giving more points to the person who's probably already in the lead. Now, what do you think of the bonus cards? So I definitely agree about the number in play each game. Uh, there are a few more I can easily, without even, you know, trying, think of that would make sense to add. And it sounds mm -hmm. like stretch goals in the Kickstarter will give us the additional ones I'd want, or at least some some more. Uh, and, and yeah, I you know, I, depending on your player count, whether you want to go with like a player's minus two or a player's minus one mm -hmm. amount, uh it did to me i have to say you said it didn't to me it did feel a little bit like everyone gets a trophy um right. it was they they weren't different enough to 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 sort of lean one way or the other um and because there were six of them and because they were a little on the generic side i, I found i wasn't really worrying about them during the game yes. i knew i'd get one you know i again because of that friendly ties you know oh i i'm probably going to get that one and then, yeah i can probably get that one i'm I'm just not it, and, and and at only two points it's not a big enough decision versus going after an extra campaign or two where you could get six points right no i agree uh it definitely i'll admit my it, they did not affect my gameplay at all i waited to the end of the game to see what everyone got i i don't know if they'd be something because two points in draconis can be a lot uh we definitely had games in a for small, in a with small seven player points. game absolutely yes. in the in the in a six player game not as much yeah and and just to, to clarify there are things like having the most defenders having the most attackers what you don't get thankfully is having the most defenders having the least having the most having the least they do have that for terror and i actually really like the one with the player with the least terror getting a bonus so again the player with the least terror may be doing the work better but then the way the game works you tend to only get terror if you're winning Exactly. So honestly, I think that's actually a catch up mechanic. I like, like, I almost like, I almost, if I was designing the rules for this, I would probably say you must use that one and then a random selection. Right. I, I think, I think that particular player with the least terror should just always be in play. That's fair. All right. That leaves us with the last part of this expansion, which I honestly think is the best addition 
for Draconis Invasion with this expansion. That is the invocation cards from Glory and the rules that go with them. I love what these added to the game. Uh, one of the things that makes Draconis Invasion unique compared to other deck building games is that your attacking cards, your cards for defeating enemies, or technically they're called your defenders, are mercenaries. And you purchase them during play, but then to play them, you then have to pay a cost to use them using gold coins that are in your hand. And one of the big frustrations we found with Draconis Invasion, which you can read about in our review, is getting hands of cards with defenders in them and no way to pay for them. And the opposite, getting lots of gold and no defenders when you need them. This invocation rule helps that problem by letting you put the newly purchased defender on your invocation card, letting you then bring it up when you have a hand filled with gold, when you can actually pay for it. I also found it very useful to be able to store newly purchased action cards so that basically you could use them next turn. You would put it away this turn and then your next hand, you would draw it right away to be able to get it into play. Uh, that goes with that whole making everyone discard down to four thing Sean alluded to earlier. Um, I also found that at least one of the players we were playing with was actually using it to good use to store gold so they could make bigger purchases. So if they knew they were going to be able to forward, say, a treasure card, they would also then buy another card and put it under, knowing they were going to start with, say, 60 gold the next turn, which can be big in this game. Yeah. Now, I, I'm i a little on the fence in this. I, I think they're a great mechanic. Uh, I found my problem was I kept forgetting about it because I was oh, so yes. used to the old game, and this was the, the first time we gave this, this new mechanic a try. And so I didn't make as much of a use of it as I should have. And I would have benefited from using it more. But uh, to me, it feels like they might be better to be limited uh, in storing only defenders and not yeah. being used for the actions and gold and other sort of ways. Uh, but since you only have the one card, you're limited in what you can do. Uh, you're limited in what you can store under there. So I don't think it makes a huge difference if you are able to store anything underneath it. Uh, but when they come in handy, they are really handy. And I could totally see that. Defenders only sounds like it, like a good house rule, something everyone could agree to. Heck, it might be interesting to play a game where this game we can only store defenders. This game we can only store gold and see what that impacts things. Yeah. Maybe roll the treasure die on a one to two, you can store this on a two to three or the terror die. That, that sounds like some interesting house rules. I might actually point that one out to the uh, the designer to see if he wants to do something with that. Or make it an event. Tie That way you tie in a whole other mechanic of the game. Tie the events to, to your invocation. You go. In some way, everyone who has a store to card takes a terror would be a great event to throw in there. You listening, Jeff? Of course, then it's adding a whole other aspect to this expansion. So looking at all three of these modules, um, personally, anytime I play Draconis, I'm going to use invocations. I, they sped up play. They made some high cost cards more valuable and useful. Um, they made some really high. The, some of the defenders were like, it's not even worth it are now worth it if you can store them. Um, I'm going to use it in every Draconis game. I'll probably toss in some bonus cards, though I still don't know what the proper mix is. I don't know if it's number of players or players minus two or players plus one. I don't know what it is. And while the champions, surprisingly, were the aspect I expected to like the most because I love asymmetry, those to me felt the most optional. Like, I'll use them if other people want to use them, but I'm perfectly happy to leave them in the box. Yeah, I think uh, just under, play, under the player count is probably best for bonus cards um and then with a larger group you can go for even less to just to make them that much more rare mm -hmm. uh invocations absolutely a must have there's no reason yeah. uh not to and uh for me allowing with more knowledge in advance i would always want the champions in there it's really knowing what's coming mm -hmm. because they really caught us off guard oh yeah um, it hurt um not not being aware of what someone else was about to had the potential to do to you uh just it, it just felt it like a knife in the back <laughs> yeah it was really frustrating on on both sides even the person doing it sometimes it was yeah. just like oh i just ruined everyone <laughs> uh, overall looking at draconis invasion glory uh i think this is a great expansion for draconis uh, well worth picking up for fans of draconis invasion um even if you don't love all three modules presented here i think most groups are going to find at least one they won't want to play without. I'm personally thinking that's probably invocations, but not necessarily. Maybe not. Someone won't love that. Be able to store a card. Um, I do dig the uh, the new gameplay elements here. 
Now, another aspect of this expansion worth noting, though, actually, is that those invocation rules and bonus cards do fix some of the complaints I've seen about the base game, including ones we've made ourselves. And I think that if you thought Traconis Invasion was okay, ah, it's an interesting duck door, it's kind of neat, I like the theme, or if you thought it was okay, but not enough for you to go out and buy the game, you might want to try to give it another shot with these expansions in. Because I can totally see this making... Uh, for you, what was a meh experience into a good game or from a good game to a great game. Like it really does improve on the original, which honestly is the best thing an expansion could do. Absolutely. This expansion has improved a game that I have already been raving about. Now, the one thing we do have to consider is this is a Kickstarter that is going to launch soon. I am looking forward to see what else is going to get added. Now, I don't expect anything to change with the invocation cards. I think they're pretty much a done deal. I'm hyped to see what new bonus cards and campions will be added. But that said, I personally think this is a fine product as it is, and I would pick it up as it stands now. So to me, anything that's going to be added in the Kickstarter is just icing on the cake. And it's just going to make this an even better value than it already is. Well, that's it for our preview of the glory expansion for Draconis Invasion. When you have time, I invite you to also check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. You can also show your support at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and get your name on this list like Donna. Thank you to our own personal paladin. Courtney Jackson, thank you. Valentine Passion, thank you. Quick reminder, if you want to link to our Discord, you just got to hit me up. Matt Lichtenwaller, thanks, Matt. And Roger Malosh, I actually talked to Ian yesterday. Still no open gaming at the CG Realm, but it should be coming soon. Things are opening up. I look forward to gaming with you in person again. Maybe I have to convince Deanna to have an in-home event and get everyone over at once. So I do want to see how the numbers turn after things have opened up. But so close. If we were going to have game night next week, I would have I would have said I'll see you there. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to drop the portcullis. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. And again, if you like the content we're providing, you can support us through Tabletop Bellhop, or sorry, patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop where you'll also get some cool bonus material that we put out each week, like early access to the What You've Been Playing Wednesday segment, uh, the audio from our coffee breaks and after show and other cool stuff. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. And don't forget stopping by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.